I'd like to talk about an amazing creature, people. In life, people are often seeking information. That led the psychologist George Miller to describe people as informivores. Informivores try to find and devour information, much like foragers seek and devour food. And both informivores and foragers are trying to figure out how to get lots of it quickly. Pete Paroli, a research scientist at Park, and his colleagues have spent more than a decade trying to figure out what features of information resources help or hinder people's ability to find out what they want. One of the major attributes that informivores use to guide their searching is what we call the scent of information. As we browse the web, we're using cues of the pages that we look at to try and figure out whether we can get to the information we want from where we are, whether it's trustworthy, whether it's solving a problem. And we're also looking at these cues to figure out what options are available to us. If you have a web page and you'd like to know whether the scent on the page is poor for the people that come to that page or site, there are several telltale signs. If you watch people use your site, you can see them flail around when they get to a particular page. They don't know where to go. Another technique, and one that Jared Spool and colleagues have used successfully at User Interface Engineering, is to look at people's confidence as to whether they're on the right track right before and right after they click a link. Before tells you whether the link that you're looking at is a good one, if, whether it has high scent. And people's confidence after tells you whether the page that you land on beacons the information that you're trying to get to. Another great way to tell when people are having trouble with the scent of information and how to follow the trail is their use of the back button. Lots of use of the back button, major problems for your navigation. Here's an example of a menu bar of a web page that I think exhibits particularly low scent. This is the menu bar for the Stanford Federal Credit Union, a bank. To give you a feel of what it's like to interact with it, if you mouse over any of these navigational elements, you'll get a second layer of navigation. However, even with that second layer, this page exhibits many of the scent problems that I think are common for low scent pages. For starters, the categories aren't written in terms that I think most of the people that come to the site are familiar with. It's hard to figure out what's behind loan click or transact. This is my bank, and often when I go to this site, I have to try several different options before I figure out which one has the particular page I'm looking for. Also, the navigational links on this page are short. There's only a couple of words, and this combination of jargon by the designers as opposed to user-centered terms and the brevity of the links makes it very difficult to see behind those links. Also, as we see, a lot of the cues that would help me figure out what's behind transact or loan click or account view, those are hidden in a secondary layer of navigation. You, of course, can mouse over one at a time and get to them, but it's relatively slow. And finally, the designers of the site presumably offered icons for each of the menu elements with the intuition that icons make things better. They provide a picture and pictures are good, right? But these icons don't provide much additional information. While good icons can often improve the usability of a site, generic icons really help. Another example of generic icons are the web page icons that you see along the left hand side of this page here, which is the website for the HCI class online. The generic globe page doesn't tell me much about the link, and so it doesn't add any information. Those pixels could be better put to use with a more specific icon or with additional words. Icons do help when they facilitate repeat recognition. If either the first time I come to it, it shows me something I expect, or if it's a good reminder for when I return. Icons are also really helpful when you know what something looks like, but not what it's called. And that could be because it's a language you're not familiar with, or it could be because there are multiple different terms and you may not understand which one is being used in this case.
And good icons can also help with redundant coding because if you can recognize either the picture or the word that goes with the icon, then you're in business and you can get going. And they can teach you about each other. So I'll learn what the word means from the picture that I might be familiar with or vice versa. If I'm familiar with the word, I can learn what the picture is. So how can we improve the scent of links? One of the most effective strategies for improving the, the scent of your website is to lengthen the links that you have on the site. As opposed to having one short word, add a longer explanation. And you, when you do this, add specific recognizable terms, uh, what Jared Spool calls trigger words and not stuff that's funny or clever or is the terminology favored by the design team but not the users. Long specific link titles like seven or eight words not only can help improve the scent of the website it can also help improve the accessibility because many of your users who are accessing your site through a screen reader will really value the specificity of those links to be able to understand what's going on. One example of that is that when the HCI course began, we had a link that I think was called grading policy. Few people realized that behind that link was where we explained the different tracks of the course. And for good reason, the word track was nowhere in the link. After a week of confusion on the forum, we realized this and were able to redesign the link to be longer and more specific and include multiple different trigger words that might bring people to that page. Another example from the intro HCI class that I teach at Stanford is we had a video where the link had a really short here as the only word in the link. After somebody emailed me asking where the video was, and I knew it was on that page, I realized that I could redesign that link to expand it out to be multiple words. And since redesigning that link to be longer, nobody's emailed me saying they had any trouble. One of the biggest impediments to improving the scent of navigational elements on a site is that we have a really good general purpose impulse to try and not put too much cruft on things or make it too long. However, with navigation, often more is better. And a great strategy for effective navigation is what's called speaking block navigation. And this set of examples collected by Smashing Magazine provides a good intuition as to what speaking block navigation is. By adding multiple different words, perhaps subheadings that are underneath the structure, or an explanation of what the main word or catchphrase is, that can help users get to the place that they want to go. When you provide links or content on a page, does it matter where on the page you put them? Absolutely. And one way that you can see this is with a number of eye tracking studies that have been done over the last decade or so. This one is compliments of Ed Cottrell from his research group at Microsoft. And what you can see here is that the places on a page where a user looks most are visualized here in red as a, as a hot spot. And places where people look less frequently are in blue colors. The distribution of gaze is remarkable. A huge fraction of people's time is spent looking at a relatively small portion of the real estate on the screen. And these are habits that we build up and carry across to multiple different websites. Very cleverly, we build up a sense of where the good stuff often is, and we ignore where the bad stuff often is. And you can then use this to design for glanceability. The Pointer Institute has produced this diagram which shows where in general people mostly look and these results are for English language web pages. Presumably they generalize to most pages that have a left to right reading order. A lot of the key stuff is in the top left. That's the red area. Then there's a secondary ring around that. And finally below the fold and off to the far right is where the lowest priority stuff is. 
Now, these priority areas are obviously going to be genre dependent and based on an individual user's expectations. But as a good heuristic, top left more important as you get lower or further to the right less important. So in short, our prime real estate is above the fold and it's in places where people expect to find stuff. So this is going to be where other pages put similar content. If you have pages that your users are familiar with, following the location on screen where they have their navigational elements or prime real estate will help people get used to your site as well. And definitely don't put the navigation stuff where people expect to see ads because by now many people mostly ignore whatever locations they think is going to be advertising. While your prime real estate is above the fold, people are more than happy to scroll if they think that they're going to see something that's worthwhile. Often when there's valuable information below the fold that people don't see, it's because the stuff above the fold didn't look very good. People assume you're putting your best stuff there. So if that's your best stuff, whatever's got to be below that, that can't be so good. But if you have lots of great content up top, people will infer that there's even more further down. And many of the most popular sites on the web see users scroll pretty significantly. Usability expert Jacob Nielsen conducted a study of how people read online. And I can share with you the summary of his results. They don't. Of course, there are times where we sit down and read a lengthy article online. That's not exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about general purpose web browsing when we're fishing around for information. And in these cases, it's extremely rare to find that people will spend a significant amount of time on one site. Often what you'll see is that people have a number of tabs open simultaneously, and they're even doing totally unrelated tasks simultaneously. So they may search for a while. After a minute or two, email gets exciting, go to that, come back, look across multiple different sites at once. And all of this time, they're trying to find the relevant information. So what that means is that the successful sites are the ones that support this interlaced browsing as effectively as, co as possible by bubbling up the most important stuff. And Jacob Nissen was able to demonstrate the effects of taking this into account by changing the writing strategy and then measuring the impact on usability. Jacob Nielsen tried three separate techniques to improve the usability of these websites making the text more concise, making it more scannable by using subheadings, bulleted lists, and short paragraphs, and using more objective language as opposed to what Nielsen calls market ease. And what he found was that the effects on the user experience were really significant. The good news is that all of these strategies are really straightforward. And if you'd like to learn more about improving the navigation of websites, I highly recommend these three resources shown here.